Anybody else hearing the song Anticipation in their head? <laughs> okay, you're on. Good evening. I'm Dr. Darlene Rossetti, the Regional Superintendent of DuPage County Schools. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for the third part in our four-part webinar series with Dr. Zars. In the previous sessions, we shared and learned about how the human psyche responds to trauma and loss of control and how we can come together as school districts and communities to support one another during this pandemic crisis. I personally have learned so much from the first two sessions. If you haven't seen them, I encourage you to check them out on District 41 YouTube channel or the DuPage ROE YouTube channel. While you're there, feel free to, to, to subscribe to our channel so you won't miss anything coming up. Tonight, Dr. Zars is going to discuss how to handle emotions and how certain attributes can help mitigate or eliminate risk to families and communities. This is such great timing as the novelty, so to speak, of social distancing and quarantining has worn off. And many of us are experiencing big feelings as this pandemic continues to loom. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you, District 41, Dr. Kaskowski, for all you're doing, Dr. Zars. Um, and we hope tonight this information will be extremely helpful to all of you. I'm turning this over now to Di Dr. Roby. Thank you, Dr. Setti, and thank you all for being with us this evening uh, and viewing this live stream. It is being recorded and will be available on both the DuPage ROE and District 41 YouTube channels, as Dr. Rossetti mentioned. If you have any questions throughout this live stream or even after this session, you may email us at dupagestrong at dupageroe.org. That's dupagestrong, D-U-P-A-G-E, strong, at dupageroe.org. We will be compiling questions throughout the segment into categories tonight for answering at the end. Please remember that your exact question may or may not be answered depending upon the unique nature of the question or for any confidentiality reasons. We will be answering all questions received tonight either live or at the conclusion of this live stream. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Kaskowski. Thank you, Mike. Um, welcome back everybody and, and thank you again to Dr. Zars for joining us. Um, I do wanna share too how the first two sessions have kind of impacted our work a little bit. Um, as we've all said, um, you know, the novelty is definitely worn off and the stress of realizing that this is a longer term situation and a longer term crisis has definitely set in. Um, but we have definitely implemented some of the strategies that have been talked about in session one and two, as we've worked internally as a district to try and support people through um, different things that they're experiencing um, with a total change in how we work and serve kids, but also how we interact with our families because um, people are hitting that um, tipping point with their, with their stress and their anxiety and their concern. And so this has been very, very helpful to us. Um, we're putting it to great use um, in terms of our interactions and just our planning for how do we support staff moving forward? How do we support um, the people who are taking care of the people um, in the district and, and how do we work with our families and community? So I'm gonna not talk too much and I'm gonna turn it right over to Nancy. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. I'm, I'm flattered, I'm honored to be a part of this. I really feel like in some ways my 30 year career as a forensic psychologist, my program on Israel that focuses on terrorism, trauma and resilience, and the course that I'm developing on survivor mentality have really all coalesced and, and brought us to this point and, and helped me be able to, to really feel like I'm, I'm stepping up. We're gonna talk about that later on in, in the session tonight and that, th that maybe this can help to make a difference. So thank you for having me. Tonight, we're gonna to focus on two things. Oh, this is who I am. I think maybe we ought to spend a little bit more time here. I'm gonna go over this in tremendous detail. I'm joking. Okay, so tonight, let's think about again, that there are two layers to this global pandemic. There is the medical, the, the scientific, and everything that flows from that, the medical issues, are people symptomatic? Do we have enough ventilators? What's the strain on our health system? Social distancing, which is what is impacting, hopefully, 
every single one of us in the state of Illinois, I would like to go so far as to say in America, and remote teaching, because that's certainly part of what brings us here as well. That all falls under the medical and the scientific layer. The other layer is the psychological. And I think some of us have certainly felt that from day one, but I, what I'm hearing from, from even the people on the call, but certainly everybody in my life, is that the psychological is really bubbling to the surface at this point. And that includes the anxiety, the fear. What do we not know? What do you mean 25 to 50% of people could be asymptomatic, but still transmitting this, disease, this virus and the stress? And so as we think about our theme tonight, as we, I mean, the theme of the series, which is surviving and thriving in the face of crisis, I want to bring us back and remind us that the universal trait of survivors is that they never give up. They just keep going. So as for me, I am now, I have finished my fourth week of sequestering. And in Illinois, we are going to be in this circumstance till the end of April. So by the time we're done, we're going to, are going to be close. Those of us who started sequestering immediately, we're going to be nearing eight weeks of social distancing. Okay, so tonight, we're going to focus really on the two parts, managing emotions, and then the protective factors that we bring into the crisis. So if we think about managing emotions, it's absolutely critical to surviving a life-threatening situation. And that doesn't mean that we deny that there is a life-threatening situation. We, the, what managing emotions is about is that we stay calm despite the threat, despite the danger. And for the most part, and here's the overarching theme of this first chunk, is that either you control your emotions or your emotions control you. So sit with that for a second. Either you control your emotions or your emotions control you. And if you think about the impact of our emotions on decisions, I think all of us can recognize crisis notwithstanding, we didn't need the global pandemic for us to realize that we don't make our best decisions when we are overcome with emotion. And all you have to do to think about that is think about the last time you were in a heated discussion, some might call argument, some might go so far as to refer to it as a fight. So think about that last time that you were in that heated discussion with a significant other, with your parent, with your children. Typically, it's even harder when you've got that emotional history, that, that years or decades of baggage that you're bringing. And when you are overcome with emotion, that doesn't tend to be when you make your best decisions. That's not when we tend to be really productive about the need to calm ourselves down so that we don't say things that we cannot take back. And in the face of danger in particular, we need to be able to accurately assess the situation in front of us and then make sound decisions. So we need to accurately assess the situation, whether we like it or not, we need to be able to accurately assess that. And if you look at this graph here, I think this graph helps us see that either side of an optimal stress level is not productive to our decision making. So if I am, if I have such low stress that I have no energy, if I'm bored, think about our students in the classroom, if I'm bored to distraction, if I'm depressed, that is a that level of low energy is also going to impact my ability to make good decisions. And on the other hand, if I have high stress, like in, the, in a crisis, then that too impacts my ability to make decisions. So what we're really looking for is that optimal level of arousal, where we have just enough arousal and we can control that arousal in the right intensity and for the right duration, dependent upon that crisis. So let's think. I love movies. I've got my little movie right here in front of us. And I talk about movies because I think movies are a really non-threatening way to access, access this kind of information. So if you think about Apollo 13, we had three astronauts out in space. There was an explosion on their spacecraft and they were in trouble. And there's a couple of key moments. I've been watching this movie since the last time we met and I've been taking copious notes. So these are the ones that I think I really wanna highlight tonight. Remember when Ed Harris, and he was the guy who played Flight, when he said, when this first started to go bad, 
And people started to get really frantic and emotions started to rise. And Ed Harris said, work the problem, people. Now, if you think about what's underneath that, it's compartmentalize your emotions, manage your emotions so that we can get to the problem solving stage of this crisis. And there's another point up in space where the three astronauts are starting to fight. And what's really interesting about this fight is it kind of came down to blame. And the, the one, the Bill Paxton character was accusing the Kevin Bacon character of maybe being at fault, that maybe this was his fault. And Tom Hanks, you can tell, isn't quite sure how to get in the middle of that. And suddenly as the argument starts to spiral, he jumps in and he says, we're not gonna do this. We are not gonna go bouncing off the walls for 10 minutes just to end up right back here trying to figure out how to stay alive. Again, managing the emotions to stay focused on the problem solving and the decision making in the face of crisis. And later on in the movie, when the engineers were all saying, uh, nah, nah, I don't think the space can do this and I'm not prepared for that. And Ed Harris says, I don't care what it was designed to do. I care what it can do. Again, manage your emotions so that we can problem solve and make good decisions and think outside the box. And finally, there's a point again, when they're back in the room and he's with about eight or 10 scientists and they start saying, I'm not sure we can do this. And Ed Harris says, we've never lost an American in space. Failure is not an option. Talk about crystallizing, managing your emotions so that we focus on problem solving and decision making. And notice that in all of those examples, it's not that they, Tom Hanks or Ed Harris, it's not that they didn't feel the surge of emotions. They did. It's that they managed their emotions in that moment and they did not allow their emotions to dictate their actions. And, and notice I keep saying the word manage. I'm not saying suppress. And certainly as a psychologist, I would never recommend that we suppress our emotions. There's a crucial difference between the two. If I manage my emotions, I consciously acknowledge that there are in fact emotions here, but now I'm gonna put them in their proper place for this moment in service of the task at hand. I have a good friend of mine who's very fond of the statement, it is what it is. And I didn't used to like that statement when she first said it to me because I felt like it was her way of denying the emotions and how I felt about it. And what it was, was the emotions are not effective right now. It is what it is. So now how do we deal with that? That's the mentality I want us to have. Now, if I suppress emotions, I deny their very existence or I deny that they are in fact connecting to the moment and an attempt to avoid the feelings is also not productive and to pretend that nothing untoward has happened or that I feel no distress. Again, I want us to think about kind of separating the two. Let's talk about our emotions. Let's process them if we have the time and the luxury to do so, because I think that that is valuable, but we need to be able to move forward and we need to be able to, to problem solve and make sound decisions. And acknowledging emotions is important. Because there are lots of times when emotions tells us something that we need to hear. And it might be something like a primary emotion, such as fear. Now, there's a great book, The Gift of Fear. I actually put the cover of the book up here because it is a fabulous read and it's a pretty easy read. It's not really, really heavy. But Gavin De Becker's theory is that fear is a gift because fear is an evolutionary early warning sign that we are in danger. So sit with that for a minute. Fear isn't I'm worried, it's not like a niggling little doubt, it's I am in danger. Now, ironically, humans are the only animals on the planet that disregard that early warning system. And typically it's because our heads get in the way or our emotions. I feel embarrassed if I acknowledge it. I think my ego can't allow me to do that. Think about animals in the wild. When they feel fear, they run, they go, they don't argue with themselves, they just move. So if we listen to our emotions, our emotions can prompt us to act. And in a crisis, 
we are feeling fear and we need to be able to listen to that so that it prompts us to act and make good decisions. Okay, remember the example last week we talked about, if you can see me looking down, I'm trying to open up my flashlight, it's true. So if you can think about last week, we talked about Dallas Fire and Rescue, and I was fortunate enough to, to go down to Dallas, and I spent several days down there interviewing various firefighters who had survived crises, and I'm very, very fortunate. My nephew, the guy with the, the baby in the helmet, that's his baby, is my nephew, Captain Zars. And so I got in to this world, and I did a 22-hour ride-along with Dallas Fire and Rescue. And last week, we focused on Jeff. And we focused on the fat, his significant adversity. The ceiling fell, the fire flashed, and he was trapped. And he could feel his hands, he could feel his back burning, and he could feel that the air coming from his tank was so hot that it was searing his lungs. And he thought, that's it, I'm gonna die. So last week we focused on him and we focused on his resilience, both in the moment, in the actual fire and in the grueling recovery that spanned two and a half years for him to come back to full duty on the job. Okay, but this week I wanna focus on Tina, Jeff's wife. And I wanna focus on Tina because I think she personifies managing emotion and it started immediately. It started, she was at a party and she saw the Suburban pull up in front of her house and, they, and two guys in white shirts knocked on the door. And when she wasn't there, they spent some time on the phone and then they turned around and they started to come towards where she was. And she could feel it. She could feel her emotions rising. She knew it was bad. They, it was just like in the military when they send those two people in the Suburban and she knew what that meant. And they said to her, you need to come with us now. And out of the corner of her eye, she could see her children and she felt the fear. She could feel that she was starting to shake. She thought that her knees might actually collapse. She could feel a frog in her throat. And then she thought, no, you just grab it all back. And she thought, stop, think, focus. And she looked at the children and she said, you're going to have a sleepover tonight. She didn't want to have the discussion in front of the children. She didn't even want the children going with them or being at the hospital. And she left with the two white shirts. And when she got to the hospital, and of course, they were, she was, as she says, bum rushed by the other firefighters. Eventually, the hospital sends out a mediator. That's how she described him to kind of explain the situation to her to make sure that she understood the medical concepts and to make sure she didn't fall apart. And at one point, Tina realized, I don't have any energy to waste on you. And she said to him, are you a doctor? Are you going to be saving my husband's life? And he said, uh, no. And she said, then if not, I have no time for you. And by the same token, she couldn't afford to curl up in a corner in a fetal position and just cry. She could not let her emotions overtake her. And she knew that every second and every decision needed to be about Jeff and whether he lived or died. And she realized in retrospect that that actually set the tone. It set the tone with the hospital and how they needed to treat her. And then a couple of hours later, she still has not been in to see her husband yet. She realizes it's bad and she needed to call his mother. And she has a great relationship with his mother, but his mother was a little bit emotional and was gonna ask an awful lot of questions that Tina did not yet have the answers for. And so Tina knew that she did not have the emotional energy. She didn't have the space, if you will, to deal with Jeff's mom. So instead, she paused and she thought, and she called Jeff's stepdad and explained to him the situation and let him call Jeff's mom and deal with the initial emotional response so that she kind of bought herself a little bit of time. And the next day, Jeff's mom gets there and she arrives and she's crying. And they're, which obviously makes sense. And they're starting to walk in to Jeff's hospital room. And suddenly the doctors are frantic. And there's that energy that's happening in a room when bad things are going on. And the doctors come to her and say, his lungs are bad and he needs a special kind of ventilator. And then they're moving him around and they're shoving plates underneath him for x-rays. And then it gets worse. And the doctor says to her, 
it's his heart. And she thinks it's just too much. It's just too much. And she sits down in a corner and she literally covered her ears and just could not take in anymore. And she thought, she actually thought, I just cannot, I, I need a second. And then she paused and she admits it was very emotional, very, very tough, but then she regained her calm and she stood up and she signed the medical forms that needed to be signed. And then another day there was an infection. She says that she thinks that she did not sleep for four days. She thinks that for four, the first four solid days, she simply ran on adrenaline and she started to get calm again and to problem solve. And so she asked Jeff's mom to stay with the children so that she could stay in the hospital with Jeff. Although she went home after school to see the children. And while she was at the hospital, she again managed her emotions and insisted that the hospital, all the medical staff on the team bring their A game. She was Jeff's advocate in this fight. And at one point she recognizes again, she admitted I was losing it and she had to get out of there. And she actually left the room and Jeff's lieutenant followed her out into the hallway. And he looked at her and he said, it's bad. It's really bad. And he actually gave her Jeff's wedding ring and they prayed together. And that's what she needed in that moment. And after another week of ups and downs, Tina realized if I lose it, nobody on the medical team is going to talk to me. So I have to control myself so that I can get the information I need to make good decisions for Jeff. And Tina knew that Jeff was going to be doing his part. She describes him as having a survivor personality. She knew that he would fight. And Tina also acknowledges, you cannot get through this alone. At the children's school, the children's principal made sure that nobody talked to the media. Her neighbor, who was a very, very good friend, stayed with her, stayed by her side. The fire department, the fire department dedicated a driver to her around the clock so that she had whatever she needed. Her sister took a week of vacation to come stay at the house so that she could stay with the children and Tina could stay at the hospital with Jeff. And Tina also used humor. And she relied on her faith. As Tina said to me, there's no atheist in a foxhole. And one time she remembers another time when it looked so bad, she could again not stand it. She could not stay in the room. She couldn't even talk to anybody about what was going on. She literally ran from the room and she dropped to her knees and she prayed. And she prayed, don't take him. And she said to me, I didn't make any promises that I couldn't keep. I simply said over and over again, please don't take him. And oddly enough, Tina says to me, I never self-pity. She says, I don't ask why, I just do. What a great line. I think that line is inspiring. I don't ask why, I just do. And Tina admits, we have bad days. Every now and again, you just have to let the steam out and you need a good sense of humor. And it's not at any time in this struggle did Tina deny her emotions. It's not that they didn't bubble up and sometimes get the best of her. But Tina consciously managed her emotions, told herself to stop and focus, or to take a deep breath, or to say a prayer, or to tell a joke. But one way or the other, to regain her calm so that she could continue to make good decisions. I think this is the very essence of managing emotions. So now if we think about that, and we think about what we've already talked about, and we think about a crisis, we're experiencing stress. And stress increases emotions, which gets in the way of communication. It also reduces our ability to think rationally and thus interferes with our decision-making. Again, think about that emotional seesaw. I'm a negotiator, even as a psychologist, when emotions are high, judgment is low. And so part of what we need to be able to do for ourselves during a crisis is figure out the way, first of all, identify with our emotions are high, but figure out the way to bring those emotions down so that we can improve our decision making. And you need to practice. You need to practice managing your emotions. It doesn't just happen. It's not that some people are just good at it naturally and others are not. So you need to be able to give it thought 
And you need to pay attention, especially when your emotions are amplified and practice like with any other skill. I'm an athlete. Okay, I was an athlete. My injuries are getting in the way. But as an athlete, we know that we're not going to be instinctively good at something. We know we're going to need to practice and practice. And that once we've started to develop that skill, honing the skill requires even more effort. And it requires effort over time. So we're going to try. We're going to get better. We're going to fall back. We're going to fall short. We're going to pick ourselves back up and we're going to try again, just as we do with any other skill. Now, there's a strategy that I like to use to reduce stress if I'm feeling a stress reaction, because keep in mind, when we're under really high stress, we have increased bodily reactions. They're called the autonomic nervous system. Our, we have an increase in our heart rate, an increase in our blood pressure, an increase in our pulse. And we have that heightened startle reaction. So we're very sensitive to noise or to touch. And as our heart races, our emotions start to ra race right along with it. And then they start to, our, our emotions start to run wild and maybe panic follows. So we, again, want to prevent that. Let's acknowledge that the emotions are rising, but we don't want the emotions to get the better of us. So a strategy that I use is a breathing exercise. And it's incredibly simple. And it's utterly free and you can do it at any time. I'm gonna practice with you guys right now. So take a deep breath in. I can see people on the camera. I wanna make sure they're doing it. Take a deep breath in, hold it and slowly exhale. Did you feel your heart settle? Now, sometimes when we're so emotional, our heart doesn't settle right away. It's kind of like an engine. You know, it's a little bit counterintuitive because we rev an engine if it's if it's moving too fast and it slows it down. Same thing with our heart. And I'm telling you, I do this anytime that I'm stressed. I do this before I do public speaking, which makes me nervous. I do this before a really tough discussion. If I'm having a tough discussion with my boss, if I'm having a tough emotional discussion and I'm pretty confident that I'm going to need to manage my emotions because I can anticipate that my emotions are not, they're going to be on the negative side of the spectrum. I take a deep breath. I advocate that my students do this before an exam. And you can see it. Every teacher on this, every teacher on this call can see when the student is so stressed and they're so anxious that you know that that's getting in the way of their performance. And I will actually take a second as I'm giving out a midterm or a final exam. And I will say, okay, let's pause. Take a deep breath. Hold and slowly exhale. You can do this if you're afraid of flying. I mean, literally you can do this anytime you feel your heart starting to race and you know that you need to be able to manage your emotions. Okay, so that's the managing emotions part. If we were all together, I would pause and say, does anybody have any questions? We're gonna save those towards the end. And we're gonna shift into the protective factors in a crisis. So these are the factors that we bring to the critical incident that help to insulate us against stress or maybe even trauma if we're at that point. Now, remember, stress is not the same as trauma. So just because we're in a crisis, that doesn't mean that it's necessarily a, a, a trauma or that we're traumatized. Okay, so there's a whole list. And there's a list right there. High IQ, easygoing personality, community involvement, sense of spirituality, robust social support, strong mental health. Now, in the midst of this very serious presentation on very serious stuff, I do want to take a moment and have you look at that little graph right there, because I made that graph. And I am technologically challenged. So I think it might have taken me two hours, I'm not exaggerating, to make that graph. So I'd like us to spend a little bit of time and just really appreciate it. But separate from that, in the middle, you notice I put social support. Because as I look at those strengths, I want us to keep coming back to social support time and time and time again. Now I'm gonna start right here with high IQ because it feels a little bit discriminatory. It buys us options. It buys us options to think, what else can I do? What's plan B? Because if I'm not that bright, odds are good I'm gonna come up with one strategy. And if that strategy doesn't work, I'm out. Like I, I got nothing else. But if I'm bright, 
Then, or a little bit bright at least, if I'm a little bit bright and I think this doesn't work, I fall back on plan B. Okay, let's keep breaking those down. Easygoing personality. Remember those of us that are my age, take a chill pill. I thought about putting that on the picture on the screen. Take a chill pill. Sometimes we need to tell that to ourselves. Sometimes we need to tell that to the people around us in that right moment and in that right tone of voice. You know, don't, that's like telling somebody, calm down. They don't calm down. Okay, if I have an easygoing, and I'm not going to say I because, well, if I have an easygoing personality, I tend not to ruminate on grievances. And what we can say is that that kind of rumination just drains your energy because you are consumed with that, that grievance or that injustice, whatever you call it. And, and an easygoing personality, because they don't do that, they don't wallow in the anger and the misery. And here I want to point out, beware of the influence of your peers. Now, many of us on this call teach students. And so we probably immediately started thinking about our students, or maybe we're parents and we started thinking about our children, didn't we? I want us to think about even ourselves. I don't think you ever outgrow the influence of your peers. So I want you to think about your friends. Do they tend to be kind of easygoing? Do they tend to be a little bit of, let's figure out, you know, the, let's make lemonade out of lemons. What's the bright side? Or are they cynical? Are they bitter? Because if you've got friends that are cynical and bitter, you might be too. And that's why you're hanging with those people. So I want us to think about who we're surrounding ourselves with. What are the messages that we're getting from the people in our lives? And what we know is that if, if you can maintain a positive frame of energy, you're not wasting all of the mental real estate on whatever that grudge is. And instead, you've opened up that mental real estate to focus on the problem at hand and to think about solutions. So I'm going to share a little story here. I call it the duck versus Velcro. So my little brother said to me one day, he said, Nance, there are two kinds of people in this world, ducks and Velcro. I said, Jeff, I'm not really sure that I'm following this story. What does that mean? He said, well, a duck is the kind of person that issues, grievances, problems, just kind of flow off their back like water off the duck. He said, but with Velcro, everything sticks. And I had a sense of where the story was going and I did not think I liked it. And I said, Jeff, what's your point? And he said, I, Jeff, am a duck. And you, Nance, are Velcro. Now, that is not exactly flattering, is it? And I don't really like that image of myself because of course I want to say that an easygoing personality is a good thing to have and so I have it. But here's one of the things that I want us to do as we look at these traits, as we look at these protective factors, we want to approach this with a little bit of insight, with a little bit of honesty. And you know what? My little brother's a little bit right. I wish I did have a more easygoing personality. I wish things did roll off my back like water off a duck. That's something I need to work on. And I'm a little bit old to be saying that, but it's true. We're, I don't think we ever get too old to stop working on ourselves. So again, have a little bit of insight. Maybe this is not my strength. And to me, what's really reassuring about that is if you go back to the list, there's a lot of factors. So maybe I'm not bringing an easygoing personality to the table, but hopefully I'm bringing some of the other things to my psychological table. Okay, the ability to adapt. This is the ability to maintain a flexible approach. Okay, this is the challenge. My strategy is not working, so now I'm going to go with this. Again, it's kind of, again, that a little bit of that plan B. And here's what I want you to think about. Because a crisis, by its very nature, is unexpected, it serves us well if we can recalibrate, if we can make a mid-course adjustment. If I'm going along doing this, and now I get some feedback, and I think, okay, now let's readapt, and now I'm going to move over here. And it allows you to meet those demands head on and to think outside the box because you're prepared. You're not that taken off balance by the fact that you're going to need to recalibrate. This is really at the very heart of survival. It is the ability to adjust and overcome. So if you think about what every single one of us are going through, the social distancing, the, 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 the shelter in place, the distant learning, we are having to adjust. 
And we can own that it's unpleasant. And there's a lot of emotional issues here. And quite frankly, again, a lot of losses of things that we're not getting to do. But if we can overcome those, if we can evolve with the circumstances, we are going to be far more likely to survive. Community involvement is another protective factor. And this is something I hear Glenn Allen absolutely excels at. This pro-social involvement helps to buffer against stress and hard times. So pro-social, what does that mean? The productive activities that help others and contribute to the greater good. So the things that we do that aren't just about ourselves, that's really how I want you to think about pro-social activities or community involvement. And it can be anything. It can be volunteering. It can be coaching, recycling. It can be mentoring a young colleague. It can be donating to 9-11 responders. It can be helping at a humane society. It's really not the activity so much itself as it is to contributing to the community at a local or at a global scale. Again, it's the selflessness. It's the, it's, it's the capacity to put somebody else ahead of yourself in that moment. A sense of spirituality. Now, this might depend on where you stand on faith. Because if you're religious, odds are good that you're going to think, of course, spirituality shields me in times of need. If you're not that religious, you might be a little bit skeptical and not quite so sure about this one. So here's what research shows. About 66% of people worldwide identify as religious. So about two thirds of society is going to turn to faith in times of need and rely on faith for strength during stress. Now, this is a challenge for us right now, because with us, with us observing social distancing, we are not able to go to our houses of worship. And as I mentioned last week, many of our houses of worship are putting their activities online. You just want to make sure that this, you, that you, again, don't let your emotion get in the way of your decision making. This virus does not discriminate based on spirituality. And the virus doesn't stop because you've entered a house of God. So we want to be thinking of the creative ways that we can continue, if we are so inclined, to rely on and to turn to our faith in these times. And again, if your church or your synagogue or your mosque does not have online services, you might want to look around for somebody who does, because there are an awful lot of them coming around that are around, and we are in high holy times for two of our major religions. We are in Passover and we are approaching Easter. So this is a time that many, many people that are faithful are going to be turning to their faith. And we need to be creative in how we do that. Because studies show that faith serves as a protective factor against a wide range of stressful situations. Think about Tina. She absolutely turned to her faith right there when, Jeff, when her husband, Jeff, was suffering from the fire. A robust social network. If you remember, I put social network in the middle. It, this is a substantial factor. I cannot overestimate. I might talk about the positive the influence of social network every time you have me talk because it is that important. And the more robust your support network, the greater the variability it offers you in the variety of stressors that we feel. And so you know that there are certain people in your network that you can turn to for different things. And that's part of what we want. The more robust your network, this person I can talk to if I'm feeling really, really emotional. This person I can talk to if I need something done. And I can ask that person for help. This person over here is already in a vulnerable category. So I'm not going to ask that person to come to my house. But I might ask that person to FaceTime with me so that I don't feel alone and isolated. And that's what you want with a greater support network. Remember Tina, she outright said, I didn't even ask the question. She said, you cannot do something like this alone. And at the end of this ordeal for them, this, this grueling two and a half year battle for survival, she said she never felt prouder or more grateful for Dallas Fire Rescue for her friends and her family, for her neighbors and her church. 
that social support network absolutely got them through their crisis. Then you have strong mental health. And you're probably not surprised that I'm going to spend a little bit of time here. I am a psychologist. Someone with strong mental health isn't just someone that's just naturally happy. It's more importantly, what I want you to think about is this is somebody who recognizes the importance of mental health, who takes mental health seriously and seeks help when it's needed. And, and <laughs> let's be honest, absolutely, there is still a stigma. And it's a stigma that I still bounce up again constantly in my career and in my life. Think about the very nickname, a shrink. Not exactly flattering on that one. When I worked for the Federal Bureau of Prisons, there was a lieutenant who every time he would walk into my office, when he would leave, and he was one of those guys that kind of led with his chest. I don't really know how to explain that, but his feet did not leave the room first. His chest did. He was a big, incredibly well-built kind of guy. So he'd leave my office and he'd look around and he'd say, does my hat still fit? The first time he said it, I'm looking at him I'm like, what does that even mean? And then I realized, oh, I'm a shrink. So he's wondering, did I actually physically shrink his head? It's kind of cute, isn't it? The first two or three times he said it every time he left my office. Okay, but what we need to do is acknowledge the value of professional help if you need it. So the same as we do with a medical doctor. If you have physical problems, you see a medical doctor. If you're having psychological problems, see a psychologist. Now, one of the best examples I have of this, because think about how can we normalize this? Because there is that stigma. And so maybe people feel weak or they feel ashamed or they feel like that that means that they're not strong. They're not tough, kind of like crying, kind of like how we look at crying. We think crying makes us look weak. I think it's the exact opposite. I think crying makes us strong because we're acknowledging and we're expressing our emotions. So one of the best examples I have of setting an example was when I worked for the United States Disciplinary Barracks, maximum security military prison, housing all branches of the armed services. I became very good friends with a, with a junior officer then by the name of Jesse Galva. In fact, I'll show you a picture because I'm in my own home. So there's Jesse in his uniform. Jesse continued to promote and Jesse became a full colonel. And he was now the assistant commandant at the United States Army Military Police Regiment down at Fort Leonard Wood. So he asked me to come down and do some training for them. And one of the things he shared with me is that the general, and I don't know if he was a one star or a two star, but one of, one of the way or the other, he was a general. The general actually put in his public calendar, which of course begged the question, he had a private calendar and a public calendar, I'm digressing. He would put in his public calendar therapist, therapy session. So he had PTSD from serving combat and active duty rounds. And he owned it and he was getting professional help. And one of the ways he wanted to overcome the stigma for everybody who worked underneath him, the entire mental, the military police regiment, was he posted on his public calendar that he had therapy session, just as he posted on his calendar if he had to go to a medical doctor. I think that's fabulous. So think about yourselves. How do we promote a positive attitude about mental health? That same nephew of mine, Captain Zars. So when he was sitting for his captain exam, we were talking through some of the questions he might get and how could he prepare for them and what best to answer. And one of the things I said to him was, how are you advocating true self-care for the firefighters. And he's like, oh, I don't know. What does that mean? And I said, well, are you talking to them about EAP? And then are you talking about it like it really matters? The same as if somebody came into the office and you thought they had a broken leg, you would absolutely insist that that person go to a medical doctor. What do you do if somebody who works for you is obviously struggling psychologically? And do you just kind of make a flippant comment or do you actually follow through? And do you make sure that this, that firefighter is aware of the services and are you helping him to locate those services? That's what we need, a true commitment to a strong mental health. Because let's even look at mental health treatment in terms of what we're talking about tonight. Mental health or what we've talked about so far in this series, mental health treatment builds an internal locus of control. The notion that I can control 
my circumstances, even if maybe I cannot control the crisis. Mental health treatment helps you to find challenges and strategize ways to cope. It helps you learn to listen to your self-talk. Think about pink. Change the voices in your head. Make them like you instead. I need a positive self-attitude to be able to be confident that I can come up against the challenge of whatever crisis is in front of me. Learn to identify, to label your emotions, and then to manage them so that I am not making my decisions based in my anger or based in my fear. I'm problem solving and making my decisions based on that judgment. Learn adaptability in the face of change. So what's going on in our lives and how do we adapt to that? In essence, you could argue that therapy is guided practice for the critical skills that we need to survive in the face of crisis. Now, I'm not saying everybody needs to go to therapy. I'm not, just like everybody doesn't need to go to a medical doctor. Put it in the exact same proportion. If I think I have a broken leg, and I'm not great about going to doctors, I'll own that, another thing I need to work on, then I need to go to a medical doctor. And if I'm struggling psychologically, if I'm feeling like I'm over my head, then maybe it's time to see a psychologist. And here are a couple of personal coping strategies. I'm kind of past my moment. So again, support system, leisure activities. Let's remember that in the face of this. Utilizing your strengths and recognizing that you don't have to have every strength. You're not going to have every strength. Let's be humble and have a little bit of insight. Maintaining a sense of humor. It is invaluable. Exercise. I saw something come across my screen today that because so much of us are observing shelter in place and so we're social distancing, we're spending a lot more time sedentary. So we need to remember to do the exercises to stretch our spine and we need to do all sorts of other exercises that I'm you know, not going to tell you about. There you go. No, 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 boo-boo. And we need to walk outside when we can, if we can. And we need to maintain some exercise in the face of what, because even if you think about when we start focusing on screens, we're hunching, we're bending, we're coming close. We need to make sure that we're straightening out our spine, good diet, spiritual beliefs, if that is something that, that comforts you, and talking with trained professionals if you need it. Because here I'm going to come back to it again. The most significant factor in preventing PTSD, despite the trauma, is not a psychologist, it is social support. So how can we access our social support to see us through in this time of crisis? And I'm throwing up the same slide. I gave a lot of thought to how I wanna end. I'm gonna end right back here, just as I did last week, because the emotions are getting to us. This is getting really, really tough. And some of us are starting to wonder, do we really need to do this? You know, Illinois numbers are looking pretty good. Personally, I think proportionately. Part of why Illinois, why we don't have the third largest numbers in the country, since we are the third largest city, Chicago, I think is because we were the second state to shelter in place. And we have been practicing social distancing if we are utilizing that internal locus of control, we've been practicing social distancing longer than a lot of people in this country. So let's remember, you're going to have bad days. You're going to have bad moments. And courage does not always roar. Sometimes courage is the quiet voice at the end of the day that whispers, I will try again tomorrow. I want to end on that same note. Here are the questions. I'm going to come back to this one. This is who I am. These are my references. I'm a university professor. So I'm gonna go back to this and I'm gonna turn it over to you guys. Thank you, Dr. Zyers. And I'd like to remind everyone that we are currently taking questions at DuPageStrong at DuPageROE.org. And I found it kind of ironic that you mentioned this book. You have it right there in front of you? <laughs> Dr. Rossetti handed it out to us uh, at the beginning of the year. I have yet had to find the time to uh, Read it, so that's one of my goals. Okay, we time. have a lot of time on our hands. You didn't really think you were going to stop <laughs> that excuse past me right here while I'm talking about it, didn't you? It's a great uh, book, and it's a good read. It's an easy read. It's not dense. Well, it's a goal of mine over the next month. Next um, month, by the time I do my next lecture, by the time I do my next session, I'm asking. <laughs> Dr. Rossetti, good job. I'll try. <laughs> uh, so again, I'd like to remind everyone we're open for questions at DuPage Strong at DuPageRE.org. 
and also remind everyone that our session is being recorded and archived on the DuPage ROE and District 41 YouTube channels, along with a list of resources that are available that we hope will help. Um, we have a couple of thank yous. I appreciate what you're doing. Um, one comment that it's great that people are using masks and gloves, but please dispose of them properly. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> um, and uh, one question is all that I seem to have at the moment, unless more come in. Probably more for you, Dr. Zars. Any hints for helping young children learn to manage emotions? Yes. So a couple of things. One, as is the case with anything else parents do, model. So the first thing is, do you model how to manage emotions? And again, that means give the child the space to express their emotions. This is unusual. It's a little bit scary. So let's own that. Also, target that to their age. And that's not even just a physical age. That's more of a social socio-emotional age. So we can tell more stuff to older children than we can to younger children. Keep in mind though, that they have access to probably more internet than we do. So they're hearing a lot. So sit down and talk with them. How are you? I literally at this point now open every single class, no matter what the topic, I say, how are you guys doing? And I give my students, before I go into whatever the topic of the day is, I give my students the opportunity to talk about how they feel, and talk about what's going on, what their unique challenges are, then let's move into class. Another thing is structure. I had a friend of mine joke that um, she's not taking showers and getting dressed. I was on a meeting yesterday with like 75 people, I'm not even joking, 75 people, and one of the, one of the women said, I'm kind of proud of myself, I took a shower today. Okay, I think we've set the bar a little low if we're proud of ourselves that we took a shower. So what I want us to think about is maintaining structure. It's very comforting. So have a bedtime. Let's start there. Get that eight hours or whatever, but get a good night's sleep. Get up in the morning and have some of the same routines. So we eat breakfast. We get dressed. We brush our teeth. Then we spend some time on school. We break for lunch, build in some activity, some, some physical movement, preferably if you can get outside, break for dinner, have some fun time. So literally, let's put a structure back in place, at least Monday through Friday, that's very similar to the structure that we had before the crisis. A, it keeps us focused, and B, it's very comforting. We like, we say children like structure. Let's just be honest. Most of us <laughs> like structure. Most of us do well. <laughs> Anybody else have, have anything to add to that? Okay, that's our only question then for the evening. Uh, that's it. Thank everyone for participating and open the floor for any closing comments. I, this, this is Darlene. I just want to say thank you again. I think my big takeaway today was um, just everything you said for me, kind of that importance of self-reflection. I mean, this is really an important time right now. So, you know, I think your three sessions for me is really kind of built up you know what, what do I need to do? How can I better manage my emotions? All of those things. How can I, you know what I mean? Just kind of, um, as I said, just be more self-reflected. If not now, when? <laughs> I mean, this is the time, I mean. Well, and it's not too late. And, and so right. two, one, it's not too late to look at any of these things and kind of recalibrate right now in the middle of the crisis, how are mm -hmm. we approaching it? But number two, yeah. the beauty of anything that you do during this crisis literally is going to generalize when we're done with this crisis, because eventually this too will pass. Mm -hmm. And now as we live the rest of our lives, there will be some other adversity in our lives. And we are going to be able to draw from what we did during this time and go into that crisis better prepared. So it's yeah. valuable twice. It gets us yeah. through this crisis. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to use it again next crisis because there's going to be one. Who are we kidding? Yeah. Okay. So Thank you. Since we do have a little bit of time, we did have another question come in. So uh -oh. let's throw it out there. I'm worried now. Are there specific mental health worker outreach plans 
to students and families who have barriers because of language, non-first language English speakers, where poverty and low income issues have raised the level of stress and disruption for our students? That's too um, I can take that one, Mike. Um, at least from a school perspective, as we've talked about before, sometimes schools um, are the only support network that families have. Um, but our professionals um, who work with our families who are language learners um, are helping to connect people with community resources um, and, and kind of build that um, social support network. What we've come to realize is for many of our families, we're it. We are that social support network. So we're working to fill that void. But yes, helping people make connections whether it's um, accessing online supports because people can't leave their home or trying to help them navigate the language barriers that exist. Um, again, I would say your best course of action is everybody has that point of contact with school, protect, particularly if you're a non-English speaking family. So reach out to your primary contact, whether it's the teacher, whether it's a social worker, whether it's somebody in the language program and, and we are connecting people with um, help and support um, who can meet their language needs as well. And I'm going to jump in on this one because we have a lot of people who are who are paying attention who actually are not just in this district. So know that there's an awful lot of telehealth services being offered right now, and many services are not charging during this time, or they're allowing for reduced for prorated fees. So if you're in trouble, mm -hmm. reach out. Because odds are good, you're going to be able to get connected, especially during this time. Yep. We are and in the mental health field in the psychology, you know, in, in the psychology world. We are very aware that this is really, really tough on people, and we don't want people resorting to bad decisions. We don't want people with anger problems. We don't want people with substance abuse problems. So we are very aware that it takes a village, and we're all yeah. in this together. Any other questions, Mike? That's it. That's it. Um, you know, I'm gonna, I guess, close us up before Darling Nancy, but there were a couple of things that you said that I think are particularly relevant um, in terms of looking at how we're approaching things, but um, going back to your, your movie connection and saying that you don't care what it was designed to do, I care what it can do. I think that really applies to schools and it applies to the conversations that we're having. We weren't designed to do what we're doing right now, but can we do it? Absolutely. And I think also that the failure is not an option. It's not an option for any of us, you know? So whatever challenges come up and it's literally sometimes day by day, hour by hour, um, we're having to recalibrate. And, and so having some words to put to it that um, I didn't know we were doing all the right things and, and that those things have, have words. And, and so I think it's very helpful to be able to talk with your teams and say, we're, do, we're doing exactly what we should be because our system was not created um, to teach kids in this way, but are we able to? Yes. Is it the same? No, um, but we will, we will come through it. And so maybe I, that's an assignment. Maybe the assignment one day is watch Apollo 13. And maybe the assignment another day is watch The Martian. Because we can learn from what these people are doing in these movies. And a lot of times, let's just be honest, a movie feels a lot more accessible than somebody like me. So watch these <clears throat> movies, Apollo 13, The Martian, and see how they are utilizing survival skills to get through their crisis and figure out how do we adapt that concept to what we're doing in our school district, in our jobs, in our homes? You know, I just want to add one other thing. And just listening to, to both Melissa and you, Nancy, just now, um, you used the words, uh, the word um, connected multiple times, both of you. And I just think it goes back to everything you mean. Maybe you take that for granted. I think as a society I'm talking about, we are more connected than we really realize. 
And like when you were saying, when Melissa was saying, just talking about, you know what, caring for all the children within, you know what I mean, the, the, the Glen Ellen community. And we're doing it because we're connected to others. We know the resources that are out there. We talked about Glen Ellen too, of being that, you know, that volunteer community that helps others and stuff too. You know, again, it's just something that I, I think we, again, I'm just going to say this, we do it naturally. And I think in this, you know, in periods like this, it just kind of comes together. And I think that's a real plus. I think that's a real plus. And I think that's a lot of what District 41 was was hoping, like people like outside of District 41 would also gain from this. So I just want to say thank you. This was just great. And and um, I'm, I can't wait to our next session, which which might not be, and unless we think of some brilliant thing in between, um, might not be till our transition time. And how do we, you know, get back you know, um, kind of get back, transition, I guess I want to say, to where we were. I think and it I, will be equally as hard to start wrapping our brains around everything that has to happen to come back because we're getting in a groove and families are getting in a groove and, and yeah. uh, you know, I think we're all going to need some help and some prep to think about what that looks like because we know it's going to look different. And I want to acknowledge again what you guys are doing here. The, the Regional Office of Education, Glenn Allen and Francic, you guys have come together to embody what we're talking about. How do we marshal resources? How do we provide for the needs, the psychological needs of the people in the community? And how do we open that up and make it as accessible as possible? And I can tell you there are people in my world from New Jersey, from South Carolina, from Missouri, from Texas, from California who are taking part in this. So this really went much broader because you guys found a way to make this so accessible. And hats off to you guys. Congratulations to Glenn Ellen, to the Regional Office of Education, and to Francic for sponsoring this series. Thank you all. We look forward to seeing you again. Watch us on YouTube. Take care. <laughs>